Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to do this pen and ink of Big Ben and then do a watercolor wash. And if you would like a real-time version of this tutorial, you can find it up now in Critique Club. It is available uh, in my Teachable School. I'll have a link in the video description so you can check it out. I'm starting off in my sketchbook, and this is a sketchbook that was made by Artsy Rosie on Etsy, and I've been using it for all of my World Watercolor Month illustrations, and this was for the prompt of time. And um, I already did a pocket watch for the month. I swear I do pocket watches every World Watercolor Month for some prompt or another, so I'm like, I gotta do something different. And I've really been wanting to do more urban sketching and improve my architecture skills, so I thought this would be a really good opportunity to do that. And I'm sketching just with a regular old pencil. This is a mechanical pencil, 0.3. It's by Mr. Pen. They have a set and it's got um, a 0.3, a 0.5, a 0.7, and a 2, I think, millimeter. Uh, lead thing with refills and stuff. So it's kind of a neat little kit. This point three, though, I have to say, it always snaps on me. I think I'm a little too heavy handed for it. So a point five is probably my um, uh, my smallest one I'll typically use. But uh, it was fun to use this one. It erases very easily, and uh, yeah, I'm just getting the sketch in here, and. That's pretty much it. I, I struggle with this a bit, but I feel like if I break it down into basic shapes, like we got blocks, we got um, pyramids, we got circles. If I can break it down into those basic shapes, I find it uh, much easier to to kind of work with. And I know I'm going to be doing pen and ink here. So if I put the time into the drawing right off the in the get go here, and then I put the time into inking, then the watercolor is going to be a piece of cake. So that's something that's kind of fun if you're doing ink, ink and wash. And if you're deciding to go out and do some urban sketching, where you're going to sketch some architecture, I would highly recommend that you take a photo from where you're sitting or standing so that if you do need to finish it when you get home and you have any of the drawing left to do, then you can look at the photo and it'll be right from that vantage point that you started drawing from. Uh, so I am putting in my ink. As soon as I got just the basic framework with the pencil, I decided to go in with the ink and um, just kind of go from there. I feel if I've got the basic stru structure and proportions down, then it's going to be fine for me to do with ink. And I'm also not like really bothered by things being absolutely perfectly straight. I feel like if I draw the pencil lines in with the T-square and the ruler and kind of get the basis being pretty accurate and pretty um, uh, pretty straight, then I can go in with my pen. And if I have some little wobbly, wonky lines, it's going to add to the charm. And because I'm not doing the pen with a straight edge, none of it's going to be absolutely perfect straight lines. Everything's going to have a little wobble and wonky to it. And that's going to give it that um, personality. That's what I'm going for anyway. And that's kind of what happened, actually. I was noticing that my architecture here was developing a personality. And instead of being the, clay, the, the bright, clear day that I had the reference uh, photo from that I was sketching from, it actually turned a little bit haunted housey and spooky. And I really love that because, you know, it's going to be fall before we know it. And um, sometimes you just get in that vibe and you want to kind of follow your imagination and, you know, not follow a reference photo absolutely to the letter. You know, you kind of want your own personality take hold. And one of the things that I think is so important about doing a daily art challenge, um, and I do World Watercolor Month in July, and then I do Inktober in October. The thing that I love about the daily challenge is that every single day you have a chance for a do-over. And I always feel like my favorite artwork is the one I haven't done yet, is like the next one I'm going to work on or whatever I'm the most excited about, whatever you know, if somebody says, what are you the most excited about? It's whatever I'm working on now or whatever I'm going to start tomorrow. I feel like I, I do a picture and I put it to bed and I work on the next thing. Or I do a project and I finish it and I put it to bed work on the next thing. Um, when I get a project that's started that I'm not excited to go back to, that's where I'm in trouble because, um, yeah, if, if I'm not excited about it while I'm working on it, then that's, that's a problem for me. Uh, sometimes you just got to buckle down and push through it. Other times you cut your losses and move on to something else. So um, yeah, try to be excited about your next project and not dwell on your laurels, not think about, oh, I did this one thing that was really great that one time and keep talking about that thing you did a long time ago. Try to be excited about something you haven't done yet because um, it's so easy to get stuck. And then when we're always looking back at that fabulous project that we did years ago that nothing can possibly top, when we keep looking back instead of looking forward, then nothing that we're going to make is going to 
is going to match up to it. You know, especially if you've taken a hiatus from art and you think, oh, I painted this thing one time and you have a picture of that on your phone and you're, and you're, you know, you love looking back at it. You're so proud of it. But if it's keeping you from going forward, because yeah, if you're out of practice and you haven't really painted a lot in the last year, and this was done a couple of years ago and you sit down to paint, you're probably going to be disappointed by what you do if you're putting it up against your best work ever, your masterpiece. So try not to get uh, focusing on the past too much. Um, I heard a saying once and it says, people who are depressed think about the past. People that are anxious think about the future. People who are happy think about the present. And I think that's such a wonderful thing to keep in mind if you're feeling depression or anxiety. And granted, you know, obviously that's not going to cure anything that is, um, you know, it's not going to cure a medical ailment, but it, if, if you're kind of in a funk, it might help you get yourself out of that funk. Um, obviously, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist or a doctor of any <laughs> of any kind, but um, just kind of keep that in mind in your creativity because I think we all get in our creative moods. And here I was like, yeah, I think this is kind of spooky looking. I'd like to make it Halloween-y. So I drew a huge moon behind Big Ben and I drew a bunch of bats. And I thought, yeah, this is this is fun. And I was kind of feeling like um, a cross between Doctor Who and Scooby-Doo when I was sketching this in. And I was just having a ball with it. And I'm like, well, so what if I make a mistake and it doesn't turn out good and I don't like it? I have another chance tomorrow. I'll post it because I'm doing a monthly challenge. And that's part of the fun is like posting every day. Um, it's kind of almost like the, the final stage of the artwork is to put it out there for the world and then to get the feedback on it. Um, you don't have to do that if you're doing a daily challenge. But for me, it keeps me accountable and it makes me want to do my best or at least do something interesting every day because I know other people are going to see it. So I mean, that might be if you're if you're trying to do a daily challenge, but you just can't, um, you just can't figure out what's your why, why are you doing this? Why, why, you know, you just want to kind of conk out on it. You're not happy with it. Maybe you need to post it. Maybe you need to get that feedback. Hopefully you don't. I happen to be somebody that seems to need that validation from strangers on the internet. So I post it because I'm curious as to what people will think about it. I get inspired when I see other people's artwork and I'm hoping that I'll inspire others. So for me, that's the final, that's the final piece of it is having other people observe it and see it and, and uh, tell me what they think of it. You know what I mean? But Maybe that's not important to you. Maybe it's just working the sketchbook and getting that practice in. It's like, you know, I exercise every day. I don't need anyone to see that. I don't want anyone to see that. Um, but some people, you know, they they exercise online because it helps keep them accountable or they go to the gym because it keeps them accountable. You know, figure out what it is that's going to make you stick with it because that daily practice really will push you forward. I always notice that I level up in my speed. I level up in my um, in my my imagination and I level up in um, accuracy when I do a monthly challenge. It's kind of like boot camp. It's kind of like just getting you back in shape after maybe a little bit of a hiatus or maybe I've been too busy doing um, more admin work with my business and less create creative work. It helps level you up in those areas that maybe have gone fallow over the last few months. And doing two of these challenges a year, even though they're fairly close together, July and October, it does keep me accountable. So I put the background in with some watercolors. Now I'm flicking on some Schmincke Aqua Bronze, which is probably the shiniest um, paint I have. But if you don't have this, you could use um, a thin down acrylic paint. You could use what a uh, metallic watercolors, whatever you have is going to be fine for that. But I love that, like I tip that to the light and it's got a really cool effect to it. The watercolors I'm using are the Chaumet watercolors by Paul Rubens. They just came out. I will have a review on them. If it's not up already, it will be up very shortly. Um, they seem to be very similar to the pretty excellent watercolors. Some of the numbers even match. And when I compared swatches, they did look identical. But there are some different colors there that aren't in the pretty excellent set of 36. So um if you like those, want some different colors, go for it. I think the color selection in the Pretty Excellent set of 36 is much better. Like there's no yellow ochre in this set. Uh, so if it was me, unless you want that palette that does have a removable mixing tray on it, which is kind of cool. The palette is kind of neat. Um... Unless you really want that palette, I would say go for the Pretty Excellent set personally. It's a little bit cheaper and you get 12 more colors for the set, you know, the th set of 36. And then if you want metallics, they do have a set of 48 that's got 12 metallic colors. I haven't used those, so I can't really vouch for the metallics in that set, but 
I do love the Paul Rubens metallic watercolor sets. They're a little bit more expensive than some of the other um, Chinese brands that are out there, but I do find them to be extremely reflective and sparkly and just a, a lot nicer than a lot of the other brands that I've tried. So for what it's worth, I don't know if it's the same as the paints that are in the uh, Paul Rubens metallic set or not, but they do have that as a, as an option if that's something you're interested in. But um, but if you are interested in this, uh, the Show Me set, it was sold out the last time I looked. Um, I'll wait to post the review until it's back in stock so people don't get frustrated. But uh, yeah, if you get a chance to get it, I think it's a nice set. Um, I pro Actually, I probably won't be able to link to it because if it's not in stock, then the link will go to some other product. But um, but it is nice. And the colors mix really well. You can see I'm here mixing um, the, uh, the cerulean hue, which is basically your phthalo blue plus white, and the emerald green, which is a mix of PG7 and... Um, I think it's PY3 or PY65, I can't remember, but it's a mix. And that was probably my downside on this palette was that there were a lot of mixes, like it's like stuff that just really didn't need to be included in the palette and stuff. You know, I feel like you could have taken out um, that Cerulean Hue because you have a white and you have a PB15 and you could have thrown in the yellow ochre. You know, you I, I just feel like there would have been better there would have been pigments you could remove in lieu of better pigments that would be more versatile as far as a uh, as far as wanting to mix but maybe this sometimes i feel like the combination of colors in some of these chinese sets have to do with what people are painting in their culture and it's kind of strange moving it over to to our culture where we might be looking for more clean transparent colors they might have a lot more convenience colors like the white that's in there is a pw4 which is a a kind of more of an authentic Chinese white. It's also used to pad out colors. It's a color, it's a pigment that doesn't need to be disclosed in, um, in mixes. So, uh, you know, I, I like, I don't think they even disclosed it in the, um, in that cerulean blue hue, but it clearly has a white in it. So, um, you know, there's, that's just something there. I do think it mixes really well. The colors are nice, but there's a few that I would swap out if I had the chance. But there is my finished work. Like I said, you can find the real-time tutorial up in Critique Club right now over at my Teachable School. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.